worship our Lord and Savior this evening? I hope you are, because we are. Why don't you stand to your feet? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, We give thanks be to our God who gives us victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is because of our Lord and Savior that we have victory over the enemy, over the grave, over death. We can give him glory because of his victory, not our victory, his victory that we have through him, amen? So why don't we do this? Why don't we start off by singing about that victory? Let's sing this song this morning. I see a victory, sing it with us.
your name. We magnify your name. You're worthy. It's your victory. And because of your victory and our relationship with you, because of your shed blood on the cross, we have victory. Thank you for your victory, Lord. Thank you for your victory. Thank you for your victory, Lord. Bless his name this evening. Bless his name.
altar we lay down at your feet all of our burdens the cares of this world we lay our worries and our concerns we lay our government at your feet our families at your feet our struggles at your feet our jobs at your feet our children at your feet our friends at your feet Father, there's no better place to be than at your feet, worshiping you, loving you, praising you, glorifying your name. You allow us to come to you as little children. Thank you, Father, for loving us like a daddy should. When so many others failed us, you were there. When we failed ourselves, Father, you were there. Thank you, Lord. We don't deserve it, but we're so grateful for it.
of your blood shed for us because of the relationship we have with you because you called us because you chose us that we can come before your throne we can talk with you we can cry to you we can look to you for solutions we can look to you for strength, for mercy, for grace, for love, that we don't have to seek it in anything or anyone else. We can be whole, we can be healthy, we can be transformed because of you. So Father, this evening, as we look to hear from your truth, as your word is opened up, we seek to hear from you. Father, would you take your word, 
Would you apply it to our heart? Would you transform our minds and our thinking? So that, Father, we don't leave the same way we came. That we leave changed, transformed, new, refreshed, energized. So that, Father, we can take this wonderful joy that we have and share it with the world. There are so many lost that need you. Help us to be your hands and your feet. We will be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And all of God's people present said, Amen. Amen. You may be seen. Hello, Converge. Can we give it up for a second for our worship team, please? It's not just about singing and having fun because they are awesome at that too, but it's about God's presence and the moments with them. And I don't know about you, but I felt it. So thank you, worship team, for getting us there. And we appreciate you. Uh, also, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us um, online as well, in person. If it's your first time with us, please make sure to stop by our Welcome Center outside. We have a gift for you for um, our way of saying thank you for joining us. We'd love to get some info too so we can stay connected. Pens and paper for the note takers. We've got a couple of announcements. Um, we have our water baptism coming up on September 11th at 5 p.m. So for those of you who have made that awesome major step of accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we'd love to celebrate you um, as you take this milestone, this faith milestone of publicly declaring it through water baptism. Join us September 11th at 5 p.m. Please register by emailing admin at weareconverged.com. Also, I'm going to say it every week. I know you've seen the cool Converge merch floating around. Uh, we have a booth outside. You can pick some up there. We have hats, cups, coffee mugs, water bottles. Um, we also have, you can also purchase online at store.weareconverge.com. And a little birdie might be floating around saying there might be some cool new merch coming soon. So hurry and get stocked up on what we have now. We might have some trickling in here in, in the weeks coming. Uh, next, make sure to follow us on social, on uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, at We Are Converge. So if you're not following us, just click follow. Make sure you comment. Make sure you like. Make sure to engage with us. We love seeing your faces and tags and whatnot. And last but not least, we want to give a major, major thank you to all of you who partner with us financially. Uh, we always say that we're a no-hassle or a hassle-free um, program here as it, it relates to giving, and that's because we know that it's not for Converge. It's not for us to collect money and do things for Cassie or for Pastor Ray or for anybody else. We know that it's for God, and it's to help us use those funds through us so that we can bring the gospel to the people that need it, to the broken hearts and souls, whether it's here in person tonight or uh, via online through our um, our videos through through online. So thank you for giving. And for those who would like to continue giving or want to give, we have a few different ways to do that. Here in person, we have envelopes. So if you would like to give that way, raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Make sure to complete all the information on the front and drop it off in uh, the buckets on the way out. You can also give online by going to www.weareconverged.com slash give. You've got some giving options there. And last but not least, you can text 77977. Type in there, Converge Give, and then it'll automatically text back to you and give you a link and some options to give that way. So again, we thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the worship experience.
Yes, we are so glad that you've joined us today. Uh, whether you're in person or joining us virtually online, you're a part of our VFAM. We'd like to say welcome to today's worship experience. Listen, the psalmist said it this way, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We're excited that you are here and we get to dive into the word together. As we look to God's word, uh, just real quick, uh, anybody else uh, other than me, other than your pastor, how many of you have been enjoying this series? It's been helpful. It's been encouraging to you. Yeah. Yeah, we're learning these life lessons from the book of Exodus. And uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to change the pace. We're going to shift our tone and tenor slightly because today I get to tag team with one of our leaders here at Converge Church. One of the things we're intentional about here at Converge is about developing uh, leaders. And uh, man, God has blessed us uh, uh, in such a tremendous, tremendous way with quality people that he has allowed us to do life and ministry with. And guess what? Today is no different. Uh, I have the pleasure of tag teaming with half of our uh, e-church director team, and that is none other than our very own Andrea Jackson, who will be bringing the word with me uh, tonight. So why don't you come, Andrea? And uh, her husband, Dexter, uh, uh, partners with her, uh, and they direct our e-church. So everything that happens virtually uh, flows through their hands. So we're honored to have Andrea with us. Show your love one more time for Andrea Jackson as she comes. Uh, one of the things I appreciate so much about Dexter and Andrea is the fact that they are both diligent students of the word, and uh, not just publicly, but in private, right? Uh, and, 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 and so I'm excited about what she's going to share with me. We had a conversation offline about some of the things that the Lord was sharing or showing her uh, during our summer uh, Bible immersion campaign. As you know, we read through the book of Exodus together, and that sort of primed the pump for this series she shared a few of the downloads that the Lord had laid on her heart, and I was like, man, uh, that blessed me, and I know it's going to bless our church, and uh, invited her to come and share tonight. I'm going to do my best, y'all, <laughs> not to be a backseat driver. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Pastor's going to do his best to let uh, Andrea run with the word today, but uh, let's pray. Let's pray, and then we'll dive into the word together. Father, we love you. We honor you, and we approach your word with reverence and humility. Uh, Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path, and, and Lord, uh, in this moment, as we look to your word, we trust you now to bring illumination uh, to our understanding, to the places where we're uncertain and unclear. We look to your word now. Holy Spirit, you be the teacher you guide and direct everything we say in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. Once again, everybody, Andrea Jackson is in the house for week six. Week six of Get Out. We're learning these life lessons from the book of Exodus. Now, check this out real quick, just to bring context to what we've been learning. We've been learning a few lessons. And uh, for me, it always helps if we do a quick review. So here's the review. Here are a few lessons that we've learned. Number one, number one, this is what we said. Uh, life lessons we've learned from the book of Exodus, right? Number one, patterns always trump potential. We, we've talked about that extensively. Number two, here's the second lesson. Just because it's dormant doesn't mean you've been delivered. Mm? Number three, you must be willing to confront what you hope to conquer. Number four, this is all these lessons that we're learning from God's interaction with the Israelites. Number four, choose God's presence over God's provision. We talked about that extensively from Psalm 106 last week, how God gave the Israelites everything they requested, everything, not just requested, but the things they demanded but he sent leanness in their souls. That it's possible to have everything you want and still go through life unfulfilled because of that God-shaped void. So here at Converge, we're going to be intentional about seeking God's heart, not just his hand. In fact, Psalm 103, come on, we're going to 
Come on, come on, backseat yeah, driver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Go for uh, it. Uh, 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 Psalm 103 says it this way. In, I believe, verse 7 or 8, that God showed Moses his ways, but Israel his deeds. Huge distinction. God showed the nation of Israel his power, his, his miraculous power, but with Moses there was a distinction. He showed Moses his ways, his character, his attributes, his temperament. And that's the side that God wants us to live on. Yes, it's okay to experience God, God's miraculous power, but beyond experiencing what God can do for us, God wants us to experience who he is. And that's why Moses says, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, we don't want to leave this place. And here's what God was saying. Listen, you're about to go into a land flowing with milk and honey, but I ain't going with you. And Moses realized that it was not enough just to go into a land flowing with milk and honey to have all of your needs met and not have the presence of God with you. These are life lessons we're learning from the book of Exodus. And today, we've got another lesson that we're going to jump into because Andrea is going to help us get out of what? Other people's way. Say that one more time for good measure, Miss Andrea. Get out of other people's way. All right. Yeah. Run with it. All righty. <laughs> so <laughs> in some of the previous weeks, we talked about, you know, getting out of your own way, mm. getting out of your own head. And as I was reading through, especially the early part of Exodus and listening to the sermons on Sundays, I realized it's not enough for us to just stop there mm. at getting out of our own way and getting out of our own head. Because the Bible says in Philippians 2 and 4 that we are not to look on our own interests but also the interests of others. Wow. And as I was reading, in particular between chapters 5 through 12, I saw a cautionary tale in Pharaoh. Mm. And what can happen when we are more concerned with ourselves and our own self-interest than we are with the interests of others. Wow. And that he, in being concerned and obsessed almost with his own interests, stood in the way of an entire nation of people and how that thing impacted them for thousands of years, even to this day. Wow. Wow. All right. Unpack that for us. I'm All being right. good. <laughs> you are her, but please jump in. If I see you doing the double ditch, just, you, you see that? You see <laughs> just that? Come on, yeah, come on with it. No, so, that's powerful. Uh, we'll start first with our anchor text, and I'll give you guys a little bit of backstory. But the two scriptures um, that kind of sandwich where I'm coming from is Exodus 5 and 2, and then Exodus 12, 31 and 32. And 5 and 2 says, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that mm. I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Mama. And I just need you guys to hear that again. He said, I do not know the Lord. Mm. Let that sink in. Mm. I do not know the Lord. In his arrogance, he didn't realize what he was saying. Mm. Um, Can I then, jump in there for a quick second? Come on, Pastor. <laughs> yes. Listen, you know what I get from that verse? Here it is. What you don't know can and will hurt you. Amen. Absolutely. That's why he says in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, my people. Come on. God said this. He said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Yes. And so his decisions and his actions are about to be informed by his lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't know God because he doesn't acknowledge the God of Israel, he's about to assume a posture of yes. defiance. Yes. Because up until then, nobody had stood in Pharaoh's way. Come on. Are you hearing what we're saying? Lesson number one. Yes, Lesson. please. So then let's read 12, 31 through 32 and see where he ends. Um, then he, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night, and he said, Rise, go out, or as we are saying, get out mm. from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said, and take your flocks and your herds mm. as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. <laughs> Let's not forget that part, and bless me also. Mm. So as some backstory, back then, during that time, Egypt was, if not the greatest, a great cultural political and military power, probably the greatest in the world. Mm. 
there was no king mightier than Pharaoh. And so he was coming from a perspective of, uh, Dexter, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say the word, megalomania. Mm. He nice. was obsessed with himself mm. and with the power that he perceived that he had. Mm. So he, who is this God that I, Pharaoh, mm. you know, talk about a superpower? Egypt was a superpower. Mm. Let you all go? No, not happening. Who's going to make me? What he didn't realize, though, is that God is the greatest being in existence. Come on. Not just in Egypt, not just in the world, in existence. Mm -hmm. And that he, the one true God, trumps everything else. Mm -hmm. So he's about to learn, or as you know, my mama said when I was growing up, you're going to learn today. <laughs> So we start out in Exodus 5, and Moses and Aaron um, approach Pharaoh with the message from God. And Pharaoh is like, mm, no, I refuse. I'm not going to let you go. Um, who is going to make me do something greater than what is in my own self-interest? Mm. No one can make me. In fact, he couldn't fathom that the Lord had said this to them. And he's like, no, your problem is not that the Lord told you guys to go and worship me um, or to leave. Your problem is that you're lazy mm. and you don't have enough things to do. You've got too much time on your hands. So mm. we're going to make life miserable for you. No longer are we going to provide straw for you. We are going to make this thing hard so that you will have too much to do and be so exhausted and so brutally oppressed, you won't even think about asking this question again. That's where we are in chapter 5. Can I just say something real quick? Please do. Yes, sir. <laughs> so listen, I went back and read Exodus 5 through 12 mm -hmm. because that's where we're coming from today. Well, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, not we. That's where you're we. coming from uh, we. <laughs> today. And when I went back and read Exodus chapter 5, and I know we're, we're talking about Pharaoh, but here's one of the things that jumped off the pages of this passage. What do you do? When your obedience to God Come on. is not producing the desired results. Yes. Because here's Moses minding his business in Midian on the backside of the desert. Mm -hmm. He has resigned to a life of a shepherd. He's got a new wife named Zipporah. He's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, God disrupts and interrupts his new rhythm of life, and God says, I want you to go down to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Mm -hmm. Moses says, well, who am I going to tell him sent me? Because <laughs> mm -hmm. Moses is like, I ain't going there in my own name or my own strength. Mm -hmm. And God says, tell Pharaoh, I am sent you. Right. You know what that means? God was saying, Moses, when you get down to Egypt, you got a blank check. I am whatever you need me to be. Yes. Yes. So I don't know if, about you. If I'm Moses, I'm like, I'm good. Mm -hmm. When I show up to Egypt and I say those four words Come to on. Pharaoh, Come on. it's a dumb deal. Boom. Because I've got all of heaven on my side. Yes. I've got I am blank. You fill in the blank on my side. Yes. So show, guess what happens? Moses shows up, and Moses stands in front of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And Pharaoh's like, what you doing here? Yeah. And he says, God sent me. And by the way, God told me to tell you to let his people go. And guess what happened? Pharaoh was so scared that he rounded up all the Israelites and let them all go. No, the exact opposite happened. In fact, life became more difficult for the Israelites because of Moses' obedience to God. Yes, yes. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What do you do? When it seems like your obedience to God has backfired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to the people here in this room tonight and watching online who are wondering, how did I get here? Yeah. I thought for sure. Mm -hmm. I heard from God. Oh 
In fact, it was so real to me that I saw, I heard God's voice. It, it, it's undeniable because it came from a burning bush. Yes. And Moses shows up to Egypt. And all of a sudden, it seems like he's got no backup. That's the way most of us are. We want the abracadabra version of God. Mm -hmm. We want the open sesame version of God. That if I just open my mouth and say, let my people go, it. it automatically happens. Yeah. Yet there are times when God will put us in situations where he's not only teaching us something through the resistance and the defiance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he's also teaching Pharaoh yes. something yes. through Pharaoh's defiance. Mm -hmm. Oh, let me, go, let me go sit down. Let me sit down now. <laughs> because I might take off. The, so here's the question. Here's the question. If you find yourself in Exodus chapter 5, where you have a word from the Lord, mm -hmm. you have a promise from God, and you're walking out in obedience to what God told you to do, and everything you're getting is pushback, what do you do? In fact, it's not just pushback. Life becomes worse for all the people connected to you. Yes. Because of your, not your disobedience, but because of your obedience mm -hmm. to God. Mm -hmm. God must be doing something with this. Mm -hmm. He must be doing something with this where Moses opens his mouth and Pharaoh has the audacity to say no. Yeah. We're going to get to it. Uh, sorry. No, no, don't, don't be. It's, you're right. And when you talk about everyone that's connected to Moses and how they suffered, I mm. think that is what really stood out to me mm. out of all of this was on the flip side, every decision that Pharaoh made and how it impacted the people of Egypt mm. and how that was ab of absolutely no concern to him. Mm. And so, you know, I don't know about you guys, but oftentimes when I used to read stuff, as I'm growing, you know, live a little, keep living, because mm. I'm almost 50, and I find myself more and more in these pages than I did in my 20s. Mm. Um, and so when I used to read it and was younger, it's like, oh, those Israelites, and you even talked about that. How many times? It took you guys 40 years, what should have taken three days? Keep living. Mm. And so I think that's mm. why now it jumped out to me in a way that it hadn't all of the other years that I had read that chapter, because... Every decision he made, and I want us to find ourselves in this, mm. every decision that we make, good or bad, does not just impact us. It doesn't even just impact our family. And I'm not just even talking relationships. I'm talking in the marketplace. I'm talking on your job. Mm. I'm talking when you guys go to school. Every decision that we make, good or bad, mm. can ring out for generations. Wow. Wow. Good. And we'll talk about that, and I'll, I'll kind of bring that full circle as we get toward the end. But just keep that in mind and find yourself in here, as opposed to being like, oh, proud Andrea used to be all oh, feral, and he was a mess. Mm. Andrea is too. Mm. Mama. So we're going to kind of speed through 7 to 12 and end up at uh, 12, 31, and 32. But throughout these chapters, I kept seeing repeated references to Pharaoh being stubborn, Pharaoh's refusal. Pharaoh's hardened heart. Mm. And it just kept jumping out at me. Um, and in that, we see the consequences of his decisions and how they impacted the people of Egypt, starting with the first plagues that hit. Mm. Aaron and Moses go to Pharaoh, and Aaron raises his staff, and his staff turns to serpents. And Pharaoh's magicians say, we can do that too. Right. And then God tells them, you know, raise your staff and, and the Nile will turn, the Nile River will turn to blood. And the river turns to blood and Pharaoh's magicians say, we can turn water into blood too. Mm. And the first thing that stood out to me was when that happened, the Nile River remained blood for seven days. Yeah. The people of Egypt were digging along the shore mm. to get drinking water Mama. for seven days. And do you know what Pharaoh did? The Bible says he went back into the palace and put it out of his mind. Mm. These are people that he was responsible for. Mm. Mm. Not my concern. Mm. Put it out of his mind. Mama. Anything you want to jump in there? <laughs> Come on, Pastor. Let me just say this. 
We all claim we want change mm -hmm. until the change directly affects us. Listen, we all say we want change until it requires us to do something different. Why do I say that? Pharaoh didn't care what was happening to the, the, his own people because it didn't directly impact, impact him. Yep. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? Yet he was the source of the problem. Mm -hmm. And there are some of us who go through life with glaring blind spots. Yes. We don't even realize that the source of the problem, the source mm -hmm. of the, the struggle is me. Mm -hmm. But I don't realize it because I'm creating problems not for myself. I'm creating problems for everybody else. Yeah. Listen, I believe that this is a word from the Lord for us mm -hmm. to begin to consider how our actions, our decisions, our choices are right now in real time yes. negatively impacting others, mm -hmm. even though it may not directly affect us now. Mm -hmm. And I say that word now on purpose. Yes. Because ultimately, it'll come back to haunt you. Absolutely. And that was Pharaoh's posture. Yeah, my people out there digging around the Nile to find water, but pff, I'm good. I'm in the palace. I got plenty of water to spare. That's their problem. Mm -hmm. For seven days. For seven days. That's all I got. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of hopscotch my way through some of the, the plagues. The next one was the frogs. And um, I think what jumped out about this one for me was the frogs, uh, piles and piles of frogs. And you guys can go back and read it. But Pharaoh does call Moses and Aaron back and say, okay, pray for me. Make this thing stop. And I'll let you guys go. But, and I think it was in one of the devotionals, the minute mm -hmm. Pharaoh experienced relief, mm. He reneged. The minute the discomfort was gone, for him, not everybody else, make it go away. Mm. And then we have the plagues of gnats that infested the land. And at this point, we're starting to see a little bit of change, not for Pharaoh, but for those who surrounded him. And that's important, too. They're like, OK, wait. We can't do the gnats. We were able to do the frogs. We were able to do the serpent. We were able to do the turn the water from, uh, to, to blood. But the gnats, this is the, the literal word they said was, this is the finger of God. So they begin to acknowledge God. We're starting to see a little bit of shift. And then um, with the plague of flies, and these were not just the flies that we're accustomed to, guys. These were biting flies. Mm -hmm. So Pharaoh then begins to try to bargain with God. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll let you guys, you know, worship your God, but can you do it here? No, we can't. Okay, well, can you just go a little ways outside of the city and not go too far? And we, we begin to see that progression. Mm -hmm. Through the plagues of the livestock and the boils, he's still obstinate. He still refuses. And we finally get to the seventh plague of hail where he admits his wickedness and his sin. He mm. actually uses the word wicked and sin. Mm. But at this point, um, Egypt was, his, his, his officials used the word Egypt is lying in ruins. Mm. Will you let these people go? Mm. And still, he's more concerned with, okay, well, if you go, who's going? And Moses is like, all of us, mm, no, no, all of you all can't go. Mm. So locusts come, the locusts consume what's left, the vegetation has been destroyed, livestock has died, all of these things have happened. Mm. And he finally goes to them and says, I've sinned, forgive me, pray for me. Mm. And the thing that jumped out about that to me was Pharaoh had a theological head understanding of sin. Mm. and the need for forgiveness, and still his heart hadn't changed. Mm. He still would not let them go. Mama. And he, again, with the bargaining, it's like, okay, well, maybe you can take just the men and leave the kids and the women. Okay, well, no, you can take your little ones, and you can take your women, but just leave your herds and your livestock. Because all of this was about making sure that they came back. They were slaves. Mm. And way back in Exodus 1, he was already intimidated, intimidated by their strength and their numbers. Right. So can you imagine that many slaves leaving your country and you're the superpower? You're a hired help 
is walking out. Mm. So he wanted to make sure that they would come back. Mm. So the plague of darkness comes, and it's so dark that the Bible says you could feel the darkness for mm. three days. Now, the flip side of that is with that plague, Israel wasn't in darkness. In the land of Goshen, they weren't experiencing this. Right. It was all the Egyptians. But again, none of this concerned Pharaoh to the extent that it impacted others. It was how it was impacting him. Right. And at one point, Moses and Aaron go, and they say, let my people go. And he's like, look, if you come back here and ask me again, you're going to die. Mm. Don't ask me again. Get out. Mm -hmm. So then the final plague or the final death of all of the firstborn sons happens. And we all know, and if we don't know, the firstborn son represents carrying on the family line. Yeah. yeah. And so from Pharaoh's house, his firstborn son, all the way down to the lowliest Egyptian girl, every firstborn son in the land of Egypt died. And every firstborn livestock died as well. Right. And so he finally gets to a point where he's like, okay, all right, this might be God. Let's do something. And, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I think you guys need to go. And not only do you need to go, but you need to go now. And before you go, you need to bless me. And the, the Bible also says that the Israelites stripped the Egyptians yeah. of all their wealth. They not only left with their family, so everything they had asked for back before the first plague, they got you all can go, your children can go, your livestock, your herd, your cattle, take it all and take our stuff too. And if you are walking out with the wealth of a superpower, you're not just leaving empty handed. Come on. Yeah. So it just amazed me, the Pharaoh we saw in chapter five and the Pharaoh that finally relents mm. in chapter 12 are two completely different people, so to speak. Mm. What happened? What changed? Well, Any thoughts? Oh, wow. No, no, not about that, but I, I just wanted to leave room for you to double dutch. Yeah. Wow. I, I have your permission. Absolutely. Um, wow. There's a lot. Because if we go back to Exodus chapter 7, y'all, uh, what, what uh, uh, Andrea mentioned about Pharaoh... Uh, relenting long enough to get relief. Mm -hmm. It's huge. So, so what happened was uh, the frogs came and, and uh, uh, Pharaoh pleaded with Moses and Aaron to talk to God, to intercede on his behalf to remove this plague. So the frogs, God drives the frogs out. And as soon as Pharaoh gets just a little bit of relief, he goes back to his old ways. Uh, this is what I wrote in my notes. Uh, we've been talking about patterns. Mm -hmm. And this was a pattern for Pharaoh throughout these 10 plagues. Here it is. Uh, uh, if we don't genuinely repent, I mean change our mind, mm -hmm. we will revert to our old ways when we experience relief. Mm -hmm. And I talked to you about what that pattern is. We experience temporary remorse. Mm -hmm. We feel bad about what we did temporarily. But then we rationalize it. Yeah. It ain't that bad. Mm -hmm. And then, what do we do next? We have relief, but the relief is short-lived, so then we repeat our behavior. Absolutely. Somewhere between relief and uh, repetition, between relief and repetition, this gave me relief, so I got to do it again. But the relief ran out, so let me do it again. But the relief ran out, so let me do it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Left unchecked, if you don't disrupt that pattern, mm -hmm. it leads to ruin. Mm -hmm. It leads to destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what's happening here. What does that mean in our own lives? Because it's so easy for us to point a finger at Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. What does that mean in our own lives when we become Pharaoh? Yeah. When our motivation with our interaction with God is God, just give me some relief. And when we get the relief... We just go back to what we used to do. Mm -hmm. And then the pressure of life comes, and then we beg and we intercede. God takes the frogs away. God takes the frogs away, and we're right back to the way we used to be. Notice what the scripture says. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, don't you see how wonderfully kind 
tolerant and patient God is with you. Yes. Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you away from sin? Mm-hmm. So this is, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. Can I just say this? Because I, I struggle with the text. Because if God is I am who I am, mm-hmm. why didn't he just send Moses on day one? Come on. Moses opened his mouth, Tommy, let my people go, mm-hmm. and they all get out of there. God could have done on day one yes. what he did with the 10th plague. Yep. So there's something God is doing here yes. with, with Pharaoh, mm-hmm. with Moses, mm-hmm. with the Egyptians, and with the Israelites. Everybody has a lesson to learn. Yes. And the lesson cannot be learned just by God bringing you out. Yes. Yep. You have to remain faithful to the process in order to see the fulfillment of the promise. I'll say that again. Mm -hmm. That's good. You have to remain faithful to the process in order to see the fulfillment of the promise. Mm -hmm. So, listen, all things are working together for the good. Yes. All things are working together for the good. So, what's God doing? The fact that he brings Moses and tells Moses, go tell this man, let my people go. And he doesn't let his people go. God is teaching Moses this lesson of faith and patience. Mm -hmm. That's good. He's teaching Moses as a leader. And he's teaching us right now in this moment the lesson of faith and patience. This quote is often attributed to Einstein. But let me put some biblical glasses on this thing for a second. Everybody tells, says that Einstein said uh, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. In God's kingdom economy, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result is called faith. That's good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me give you scripture. Galatians chapter 6. He says, do not be weary in what? Well-doing. Yes. Because you will surely reap if you faint not. Mm -hmm. Why would you grow weary? You would grow weary because you're doing something that's not producing the desired result. And God said, if you will not quit prematurely, if you tell Pharaoh, let my people go on day one, and he makes life harder for them, Mm -hmm. don't throw in the towel, baby. You will surely reap if you faint not. What do you do if your name and and God tells you to go dip yourself in the dirty uh, Jordan seven on. times. Come on. And you stop on the sixth dip. What do you do if you're the Israelites and God tells you to march come around on. the walls of Jericho this first six days, one time, and on the seventh day, seven times, march around these walls 13 times, but the first six days, you don't even see a crack in the yeah. wall. God is teaching Moses the lesson of faith and patience. Mm-hmm. And what is the lesson of faith and patience? Just because it's not immediate doesn't mean it's not inevitable. That's so good. Most of us are microwave Christians. (laughs) We want to speak to the mountain. We want to speak to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And Mm -hmm. there you go. And God says, it's going to take a little bit more. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Because I'm dealing with Pharaoh, um, uh, Moses, and teaching him the lesson of faith and patience simultaneously. Mm-hmm. I'm teaching Pharaoh a different lesson. Yeah. Huh? I'm teaching Pharaoh the lesson of grace and mercy. Yes. That you can be a knucklehead mm-hmm. and hard-headed and defiant. And the God of Israel is a God of loving kindness and yeah. tender mercies. Unlike the gods of Egypt, yes. because there were many. Mm-hmm. And so God is revealing himself to Pharaoh. Not only his mercy, but also his power. Mm-hmm. And Eve, listen to me, listen to me. I don't know about you, but if I'm God and I'm trying to get my people out of Israel on day one, Done. I'm going for your firstborn. Mm-hmm. I'm going to break you right, on right. day one. Yes. But the God we serve is a merciful God. Yeah. And he's not only teaching Moses, I mean, uh, uh, Pharaoh, his power, Mm -hmm. 
where he's showing him miracles that not even his sorcerers can do. But he's still showing him mercy. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh. Pharaoh was still under the mercy of God. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. He was still under the mercy of God until he decided that he would pursue the Israelites. Yep. And he brought, he brought his death upon himself. Yeah. It was the mercy of God that kept him. Mm-hmm. And because he decided now, I let these people go, but nah, I'm still alive. I still right. got breath in my lungs. I'm going to show them who the man. Mm-hmm. And it ended with his ruin. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? He didn't learn the lesson of God's mercy. Yeah. When the scripture says all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called to according to his purpose, listen to me, God is doing something right now Mm -hmm. that you don't understand, but he's teaching you something. He's teaching you something while he's simultaneously teaching somebody something else. Notice what the scripture says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. It says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. That means because God doesn't just deal with it right away. This is what happened. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set to do evil. Wow. That's what the scripture said. And because God didn't judge Pharaoh immediately Mm -hmm. and gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to surrender, he thought he could take one more chance. And it ended with his demise and his ruin Mm -hmm. in the Red Sea. Are y'all with me? Yeah. I want to talk about the lesson to the Egyptians and the lesson to the Israelites. We just don't have time. <laughs> let me tell you the last thing I want to say. Let me, let me just put it in context for you. Listen, one of the scriptures that we use a lot about generosity and giving and receiving, the script, this is what the scripture says. It says, give and it shall be given unto yes. you. Good measure, pressed out, shaken together, shall God give into your bosom. No, no, no. No, what does the verse say, Koketsu? Shall who? Man. Shall who? Men. Shall men give into yes. your bosom? Yes. Do you realize that you can get in somebody else's way? Because God speaks to you to be the answer to somebody's prayer and you refuse to do it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen, how does God, how is God's will exercised in the earth? Yes. It's exercised through men. Come it's on. exercised through women. Yes. And God wanted his will to be exercised in the earth through Pharaoh, but Pharaoh kept getting in his own way and kept getting in the way of others. Yes, yes. And let me tell you what the scripture says about that. Let me tell you what the scripture says about that. Here it is. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. It says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. Yes. When it is in your power, when, it is, when it's in the power of your hand to do so. Don't say to your neighbor, go and come back, so and tomorrow I'm going to give it to you when you have it with you right now. That's so good. You know what scripture says? That sometimes in our lives we can get in other people's way with our generosity. Mm. Oh, no, let me put it, with our stinginess. Yes. Because God wants to do his will in the earth through you. Yes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so listen to what it looks like now. Oh, Lord, I've been praying for this miracle Mm -hmm. for five years. John, I want you to meet this need for Brother Ray. I ain't going to do it. Yeah. And we think that God didn't hear. But God says, the person who's supposed to answer your prayer is getting in your way. Yes. Because they are withholding what I instructed them to do for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I told them five years ago, let my people go. Come on. I've sent plague after plague after plague. They still ain't budged. And there are times in our lives we wonder why the thing hasn't happened. Sometimes there is a Pharaoh holding back what God told them to do. And that's why at Converge we say persistence. Persistence is not about overcoming God's reluctance. It's about outlasting the enemy's resistance. 
I'll say that again. Perseverance and persistence in prayer mm -hmm. is not about overcoming God's reluctance. I'm not praying to convince God to do something he doesn't want to do. God already answered. Yes. God's answer was, Pharaoh, let my people go. Our persistence is about outlasting the enemy's resistance. Mm -hmm. That means Moses, if the first time he doesn't budge, don't quit the first time. Go back the tenth time. Yeah. And then the breakthrough happens. Mm -hmm. Because I'm teaching you as a leader the lesson of faith, mm -hmm. the lesson of perseverance, and the lesson of patience. That's good. But there are prayers that go unanswered or that are delayed. Answers yes. to prayer that are delayed. delayed. Because you have gotten in God's way. Mm -hmm. And you have refused to do what he told you to do in order to let his people go. Yes. Is this making sense to anybody? Absolutely. I've got to ask myself that question, Justin. How have I gotten into other people's way? Mm -hmm. with my disobedience. Yeah. How are we getting in other people's way because of the things we withhold? Yes. Oh, let me just give you one. The forgiveness we're unwilling to give. Mm. We're more like Pharaoh, Andrea, than we, than we realize. Absolutely. Absolutely. Think about every time God has said to you, let my people go. Release him. Release her. Release them. Mm -hmm. But we refuse to do it as long as it doesn't align with our plan and our agenda. Yep. And God says, I will continue to bring some disruption now until I can get your attention because I don't want you to die. Right. I just want your attention. I don't want you to die. I just want you to respond. Mm -hmm. And this thing wasn't a one-time thing. It wasn't. Go ahead. And I, I was sharing with Pastor Ray earlier. I, it, for me, it was almost like a, a comedy of errors. And I, I saw this thing play out like a movie time after time after time. You know, Pharaoh would open up the palace gates or walk out, and there's Moses. Okay, what you want today? You want flies? You want gnats? Locusts, what? <laughs> and Take your pick, right? Pharaoh would go on about his business yeah. and would ignore, and, and his heart would be hardened. And mm. then, you know, the next time, Moses and Aaron would come again. Oh, we're back. Mm. What's it going to be today? Wow. How many times has he done that with us mm. in his grace and mercy and given us time after time? And I know, truth, I can be stubborn. Mm. Mm. I'm not going to do that. Really? Yeah. The arrogance that it mm. takes to refuse to obey God yeah. time after time after time after time mm. and he still gives us grace Come and on. he still gives us mercy right. and he still keeps us alive and he still makes provision mm. but it doesn't fit and it doesn't benefit me and it's not you know what's in it for me right. doesn't align with my self-interest it's not convenient that's the mm. word we like to use now it's not convenient mm. and just how much time over the span, because it wasn't like this happened every day. The 10 plagues didn't happen in 10 days, y'all. Mm -mm. How much time passed? How many people died? Because people died. Livestock died. People were hurt. People were sick. Boils. How many days do you want to live with boils? Come on. And he just, the time that passed in his heart just was like, nope, not going to do it. And it was his ego, too, because I'm Pharaoh. Mm. Who's bigger than me? Mm. But he learned. And then finally, at the end of it all, firstborn sons die. They leave. He dies in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And for me, that thing, a few years ago, my daughter and I took a, a trip um, overseas, and one of the places that we went was Cairo. And uh, as I was reading this, I thought about the Cairo that I saw in 2018, mm -hmm. where poverty was unchecked where you would have five people riding a moped, not a motorcycle, mm. not the kinds that had the sidecars, a moped mm. to get around, jumping off of it in the middle of the highway, because that's my stop, 
where buildings were blown out, where they are reliant completely upon, not completely, but primarily upon tourism for their economy. Mm. That is drastically different than the superpower, Egypt, that we read about in the Bible. I can't help but make the correlation that what Pharaoh decided thousands of years ago, mm. they lost their wealth, mm. living in poverty. And I, I, I went and looked up a few facts. It says, in present day Egypt, nearly a third of the population is living in poverty. Mm. Profits from tourism hold a large percentage of the country's overall income. So when situations adversely impact tourism, it definitely impacts their economy. Mm. In addition to poverty and poor living conditions, they suffer from political instability. Mm. Remember, they were a political superpower. This instability along with interna tense international relations and poor global image further damage an already struggling economy. Mm. So when we were there, we could look out and we saw and climbed the pyramids of Giza. We saw the Sphinx. Mm. And then we would see in the background buildings that looked like they had been blown to bits. Mm. You would see people lined up and the only way that they were making money was to sell you a souvenir mm. from one man's poor decision. Mm. It impacted not just him, but all of the people of Egypt. And the ramifications are still being felt thousands of years later. Yeah. As you drive around, you see all these billboards that say, oh, you can have the life you imagined if you just change your mindset. And yes, that's a part to play, but get me out of poverty. Mm. From one man's mm. poor decisions, yeah. one man's hardened heart. Wow. I'll ask the team to come because that's where we're going to, to close if I can get my, my pack untangled. Um, Andrea, thank you so much for landing on uh, this idea and this lesson, that it's possible uh, not just to be in our own way and not just to be in our own head, but sometimes it's possible to be in other people's way. And sometimes the way we get in other people's way is our disobedience to God. And we don't realize sometimes that our disobedience to God impacts and affects everything and everyone connected to us. So maybe that's what God wants us to do. Maybe today we don't necessarily identify with Moses. We don't necessarily identify with the Egyptians. We don't necessarily identify with the Israelites. Maybe there's something about Pharaoh that resonates with us because there might be places in our lives when we've been defiant, we've disobeyed God's instruction and we don't realize that that decision doesn't only affect me, it affects so many others. And we don't realize that we're actually in somebody else's way. So let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray tonight. And if you go back to, oh, come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar. Because the truth is, the scripture declares that it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. The goodness of God. Not his judgment, not his anger, not his wrath, it is his goodness that leads men to repentance. So if you find yourself somewhere in your life where maybe you've taken and assumed a Pharaoh-like posture, when God says, let my people go, and you say, no, that doesn't fit. It doesn't align with my agenda and my plan. Maybe tonight's the night that God wants you to let it go. Maybe tonight's the night God wants you to let them go so that God can do in them what he desires to do. Let me pray with us. And for those of us joining us virtually, I just invite you to pray with us in your heart. 
And just ask God to show you in your heart those places where you have withheld what he has asked you to let go. Father, we come just as we are. And some, Father, sometimes it's just the blind spots. We don't realize what we're doing. But tonight we come to the altar, right where we're sitting, right where we're standing. We make a holy altar unto you. And we thank you, just as the lyrics of the song remind us, the Father's arms, ah, they're open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So tonight, Lord, we make a conscious decision to walk in obedience to you, that whatsoever you say, God, we're going to do it so that we would not be a hindrance but that we would be a help. Father, use us as a channel and the conduit for your blessing, for your love, for your mercy, and that through our lives, people would get a glimpse of your nature and your character. We trust you to do that. And Lord, as we align our hearts with your will, not our agenda, we will get out of other people's we. We trust you to do that now as only you can. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen and amen. Did that help anybody tonight? Come on, somebody. Show your love one more time for Andrea Jackson for bringing the heat tonight. Yeah, why don't you all stand with us? Uh, man, y'all see that? We only have one closing tonight. Come on, we should do this more often, right? Amen. Thank you so much for coming tonight, for being a part of our in-person worship gathering. For those of you who join us online, thank you for being a part of our virtual family. We love you, uh, and we thank you uh, for your faithfulness and being a part of what God's doing right here at Converge Church. Once again, thank you for being with us. God bless you, and have a wonderful rest of the weekend. We'll see you later. Amen. If you were impacted by today's message, we would love to hear from you. Maybe today's sermon was exactly what you needed to hear. Or you prayed the prayer of salvation for the first time. If so, we would love to send you some information to help you kickstart your relationship with God. Or if you want more information on how to join our virtual family, email us at info at weareconverged.com. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so online safely and securely at www.weareconverged.com slash give. You can also text 77977, type in Converge Give in the dollar amount. You can also find all of this information on our mobile app. Simply open your app or Play Store, search Converge Church Plano and download the app. It's that easy. Thank you again for joining us for today's worship experience. We look forward to staying connected with you.